Good, he got my hint. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, I tell you, you all are so much fun. Now we can be in Chapter 12. That's right. Now we can be in Chapter 12. Tonight we're going to go through uh, Chapter uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, now that I'm, now that I'm recording. So I'm just going to jump right in. Paul just, you know, he just kind of jumps right out and, and, and he says, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I, I would not have you ignorant. Okay, so he, he, he starts with these two words. Now, concerning, so it, it indicates that he's, he's, he's still answering questions that the Corinthians have asked him in in their letter. Uh, in their letters, we don't know if it's a letter or, you know, more than one. Now, in the if you have a copy of the King James or the NASB, the word gifts is in italics, which means it was not in the text or manuscripts used for that translation. However, I checked 14 different translations and all but one used the words gifts in their translation. So the context of what we're going to be talking about tonight is spiritual gifts. It's pretty obvious that the context of Paul's statement does concern spiritual gifts. Now, as you all know, I use several different translations. I'm not I'm not married to uh to to one in particular and and I'll tell you why. Uh, I, the the Bible I study, the Bible study I go to on Wednesday, the majority of those guys uh, are what we call King James only uh, people. They they believe that any any translation other than the King James is a commentary. It's not a, a an official Bible. And uh, so, and I think you all know I have kind of a crazy sense of humor. Uh, that's why I take my NASB to Bible study with them. I don't take my King James Version. Um, my approach, and, and I'd like to get uh, some comments on this. My approach to a translation is, of course, is it as accurate as can be is I like word for word translations rather than uh, thought for thought translations. But here's my here's the question that I ask the translation: Can salvation be found in you? Now, if the answer to that is yes, then I'm fine with it. Even a paraphrased version, although I don't have a paraphrased version, don't read a paraphrased version. But if a person can find how, uh, boy, I got to be careful on how to say this. If a person can read a Bible, regardless of translation, and in that find the information that they need in order to accept Jesus Christ as their sacrifice, as their Savior, accept his sacrifice, accept his blood, then I'm okay with it. You know, they can miss a word here and a word there, um, you know, because I've learned over the past several years that doctrinal arguments just divide. And and so I'm, I'm not real big on discussing doctrines anymore. I want to talk about Jesus Christ crucified, resurrected, bloodshed, sins forgiven, repent. And I, you know, other other than that, I don't know that there's much else that you really need to worry about. Now, granted, I want to know about Abraham and what he did, and you know his family, and and I want to know about Paul and where Paul went, and all that kind of stuff. But when you really get down to it, isn't that, aren't those the things that are important? Has anybody got a comment on that or correct me on that? No, I think the only thing I would add to what you said when it comes to translations 
and I might sound like a broken record to you because we've talked about this on our Sabbath uh, group quite a bit, is, um, you know, the whole argument over which translation is pure and right and good and all these translations are bogus. This is uh, an exceedingly an American centric or a British uh, English problem. It is it is germane to our uh, English language culture only. You don't have this particular translation issue problem in say other 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 countries where they only have one or two versions written in their language. And I'm speaking from experience in terms of what the brethren in India have to deal with. I mean, there's you know their translational problems that they have to deal with are Bibles that are translated from English into Telugu which are completely and ridiculously wrong uh, when they read it um, because of the fact that, you know, English itself is an imperfect language. So the version that we we provide them funds for is a version in their language of Telugu that's uh, translated directly from Hebrew and Greek. Because the one thing you have to understand, and it's hard for us as Americans that are in our little bubble, there are words and phrases in different languages that have no translation or a proper translation into English. One example I'll give you, the word thank you has, has a tremendous meaning in the West, especially in this country and in England. There is no accurate translation in Telugu for the word thank you. The word gratitude does not exist in their language at all. It's not even part of their culture. So to approximate what giving thanks means requires a whole different sets of phraseology in Telugu to help them grasp the, the whole concept of gratitude that we just take for granted because of, of the way our language is. Now, I, I don't mean to wax off on this, but it, it is an interesting thing that we spend so much time in this country arguing over which translation is the right one and which ones are wrong, uh, when this is just, it, it's a language issue, it's a language problem. And like Skip said, if there's a translation that works best for you, uh, that's closest to the original uh, you know, meaning or if you're able to look at other translations and get a better feel for what uh, the intent of that verse may mean in 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 a in the way you would understand it, then I would think that that would be beneficial in your walk with Christ. And that's my uh, soapbox, and I'll step down from it now. Yeah. Skip. Yes. One comment for Michael. I would like to compliment you, Michael, on what you have brought to the understanding for the Bible study the last couple of weeks. You know, a couple of weeks ago, you made the comment about the uh, meat sacrifice to idols and the problem that that developed that you were involved with over there in India. And I was about ready to um, ask you if you would comment on it just as you started to comment on it. Because I think a lot of this with our culture of what we have in this country and in, in maybe in England and Europe is one thing, but some of these third world countries, the culture is completely different. And I don't think we understand that we take too much for granted. And what are our issues to us are nothing like some of the things that are dealing with these third world countries and some of the people that are trying to come into Christianity. I think it has a lot to do with helps us to understand what Paul was dealing with, with the Jewish people coming in contact with the uh, Gentiles of the age and the vast difference that there was within their culture and their getting involved with Christianity at the time. But I think I think you understand that very well and can explain that in so many different ways like you have uh, that really gives us a, uh, an insight into that. So thanks a lot. You guys are welcome. Yeah, I'll second that. OK, so uh, so. Uh, Paul, Paul says, okay, look, concerning spiritual gifts, you've written me a letter. And, and I, I want you to understand about spiritual gifts. Now, here's the, the, the New Living Translation. It says, now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know, he's, he's telling, here's something to think about uh, or something for us to think about. Why did God give these gifts to the Corinthian church? Seem, if, if King James Version is good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Yeah, Blake. 
why did he give these gifts to the Corinthian church? There had to be a reason or more than one reason. Uh, I don't know of any other church that was a group of people, you know, Christians called out ones that were blessed the same way that the Corinthians were. Now, in, in an earlier chapter, Paul makes the comment that things happen, that certain people will be manifest, that, that, that people will know that God is working with them, that they will become clear, they'll become known. That's what manifest means. So is God wanting certain people in Corinth to be recognized for problems or for good works? And then, you know, it's it's funny how good works, that, that term good works is not a, 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 a good thing to say. You know, it's not popular to talk about good works. Well, it, it seems to me <clears throat> that the Christians in Corinth, and we've talked about this, what Corinth was like, it, it seems that the Christians in Corinth are living in the cesspool of sin. A horrible, horrible, horrible place. And it, it, their daily lives include interaction with, goodness gracious, no telling what type person. Corinth would make Las Vegas look like a kindergarten. And, and maybe the Corinthians needed these gifts to simply survive. You know, we don't, we don't know. God doesn't tell us why he gave us these gifts, or to my knowledge, he doesn't. Or maybe they, they needed these gifts to help them spread the gospel. Even though they got in trouble over them, it, it, it still would have been an aid in spreading the gospel. Bottom line, as in so many cases, we just have to use those three little words. Blake, what are those three little words? You pick up poor Blake? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Starts with we. Uh, oh, uh, we, we, we don't know. Yeah, you know what? You got me on that one, Blake. You got me on that. All right. I was good. trying. That's a good one. That was good. I, I thought he was going to know. Okay, that was good. That was good. I wish Diane was in here. To, she may have heard it. She's, she's just in the next room. Okay. <clears throat> good one, Blake. Yeah, we don't know, and it's okay to say that. I don't know. It's, it's not only okay, it's a good thing to say that instead of trying to come up with an answer that you don't really understand. Okay, so God had blessed the Corinthian believers with an abundance of spiritual gifts so they could effectively minister to the citizens of the pagan church. At least that's, that's the approach I'm going to take. Whether that's correct or not, I don't know, but that's the approach I'm going to take. However, <clears throat> The believers in Corinth never came close to launching the ministry that it seems that God intended for them to launch. They just didn't work together. They gossiped. They talked bad about each other. They judged each other. I mean, it was it, it was it was bad even in the, even in the church. Why? Because many of the believers had misunderstood and were misusing and abusing the spiritual gifts which God had given them. Verse 2, he says, you, you know that you were Gentiles. Now, these people are Gentiles. They are not Israelite. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some Israelites here, but Corinth was a Gentile city in a Gentile area. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, even as you were led. And Michael could, Michael could talk a month about the dumb idols that our friends in India have to live with, our Christian friends in India have to 
be around and 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 so on. I mean, it's just it's just terrible over there. So these people were Gentiles, but the way Paul phrases phrases this is he says you were Gentiles. In other words, you're not Gentiles anymore. Now, physically, they still are Gentiles, but spiritually. They're children of Abraham. Several translations say pagans here. You, you know that you were pagans carried away to these dumb idols. But the Greek seems to support Gentiles much better, at least the, 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 the Greek translations I've looked at or the Greek dictionaries. Paul says they're no longer Gentiles. Gentiles is a good translation. It's the Greek word ethnos, E-T-H-N-O-S is the transliterated word, which is also translated nations. And I was telling my friend uh, this afternoon, uh, he asked me about when, when Christ sent the, the apostles or the disciples out and said, don't go to any Gentile cities only go to the lost sheep of the of the house of Israel and and bill was you know, you know what do you, what do you why would why would he have have said that and i had to explain to him what that that there's two groups of people in the world according to uh the bible there's israelites and there's gentiles so sometimes this word eth ethnos is translated pagan or heathen. And it, it basically just means nation. So now, apparently, Paul considers the physical to be of no importance. You know that you were Gentiles. What do you mean I was a Gentile? Still a Gentile. No, you're not. No, you're not. It's the spiritual relationship that he considers critical. They were born Gentile and still are as physical appearance goes, but to Paul, they are Abraham's sons. That is the family that they should be identified with. All of us, all Christians. Now also in verse two, Paul is saying that in their past lives, when they worshiped pagan gods, they were led by the leaders of the pagan cults. cults. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to the dumb idols, even as you were led. They were taught, taught in school, whatever their schools were like, taught by their parents, taught by their friends. And listen, boy, you think it's hard in, in the United States uh, to, to be a Christian among non-Christians. Boy, what about our friends in India? What about these Christians in Corinth, uh, you talk about difficult. Verse three, so, so now I give you this to understand. I want you to understand this, that no man speaking by the spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. This was happening all the time in Corinth. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ. He wasn't one of their gods, little G's. He said, so I, I, I want you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's something that we might want to remember. No man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to drop it right there. Y'all can do with that what you want. So, you know what, it, it, it makes sense that anyone who has the Holy Spirit would never, ever, ever call Jesus accursed, would they? So apparently, this is part of the question that he's been asked. And that's the disadvantage that we have going back and looking at all of these letters we're only seeing one side of these letters. We're not seeing what questions they asked Paul, what statements they they asked, I mean, they, they made to Paul. 
So apparently Paul has been asked this question. So in, in verse two, he said that they used to be Gentiles, but they no longer are. So one possibility is that their old temple mates, their friends, their families, are telling them that this new God, Jesus, is accursed, which of course makes other Christians accursed too. By the way, the, the, the Greek word for accursed is anathema. And I know, I think all of you probably have, have heard that. Um, it, it means an accursed thing. The Greek word anathema is found more in Jewish usage than it is in uh, pagan uh, languages and pagan uh, uses. Now, another group, see, because if, if you remember, Paul wasn't just dealing with pagans. Paul was dealing with Judaizers, in other words, Jews who taught that you had to observe the law in order to be saved. Uh, he, he, he was dealing with Jews who believed that Gentiles were lower than low, like Michael has told us about what goes on in, in India. So he, he's, he's dealing basically with three groups, maybe four. Uh, so another group that would be calling Jesus a curse would be the Jews that don't believe in Jesus Christ. They might be a little subtler in their name calling, uh, just in case this man might be God. You know, you, you don't know. Uh, now, the second part of verse three is a question about people who do the opposite. They call Jesus Lord. Now, the Amplified Bible, as I mentioned earlier about telling my friend that I, I thought it'd be a good version for him, while it isn't a word-for-word a, a -word translation, I believe they've gotten the context of Paul's words better than several word-for-word -word translations. Here's what the Amplified Bible says. Therefore, I, this is verse three, <clears throat> I want you to understand that no one speaking under the power and influence of the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit can ever say, Jesus be cursed. And no one can really say, Jesus is my Lord, except by and under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. The complete Jewish Bible puts it this way. I'm sorry, this is verse four. I bounce around with different translations. I think some are more clear than others, but they're all good. Now, there are different kinds of gifts. You know, he starts off saying, okay, now look, I want you to understand these gifts. Now, verse four, he starts to explain himself. There are different kinds of gifts, yes, but they all come from God's spirit. All come from the Holy Spirit. God sends them to people via his Holy Spirit. Also, there's, there are different ways of serving, but it's the same Lord being served. And there are different modes of working, but it is the same God working them all in everyone. Verses four through six talk about gifts, talk about administrations. Now, this is more from the King James. I, uh, and they talk about operations, but they all come under the guidance of God, Jesus Christ, and their spirit. You know, I think it was Ron, and I don't know, I'm sure other people have said it, but Ron uh, said something which I thought was was really neat. He he called the Holy Spirit sometimes, he talked about it as the family spirit. God and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is the family spirit. It's what they are. It's how they think. It's how they do things. It's their power. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Some of the commentaries I read said that verses four and six were recognizing the Trinity. I, sorry, don't see it. I, I don't see how in the world somebody would 
get that out of it. But the uh, preacher's outline in, in Sermon Bible says this. Some began to feel their gifts were more important than the gifts of others. Yeah, here we go again. Oh yeah, you can uh, you, you you can speak in tongues, but I can heal people. Healing people is a whole lot better than speaking in tongues. You know, I mean, I mean, I can just hear this. But anyway, this is what the POSB says. Some began began to feel their gifts were more important than the gifts of others. That they were more blessed than other believers. You can see that too. Therefore, all kinds of sins began to swell up in the hearts of these people. A sense of pride, a sense of arrogance, super spirituality. I, you know, I, I know some of you have seen these super spiritual people uh, and, and self-important people. And, and that, you know, th that word describes itself, doesn't it? Self-important. Not important to somebody else. I'm important to me. Self-important. So in, in those verses, four through six, and I'm going to read the King James here in just a minute. In those verses, Paul may be reminding them of what he had told them earlier in his letter. He, he said, re remember, he had chastised them about their pride when he said this. For while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I, well, Paul's big deal. I'm of Apollos. Or, you know, you're, you're carnal. Paul, Paul teaches that you don't even need to observe the law anymore. I, I'm of, of Apollos. Who, who, who is Paul? Now, this is what Paul says. He says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But they are servants ministers by whom you believed what do you mean by whom you believe they taught you about jesus christ about the father they've taught you the gospel they are ministers or servants by whom you believed even as the lord gave to every man and, and then in verse six he says look It takes a lot of different people to get the job done. I've planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Or he could have said, Apollos planted, I watered, but God gave the increase. No one's job is more important than the other person's job. It takes all of us together to spread the gospel. Now, they're, wait, they're, yeah. Wait, we lose the thought. I just want to. This is a, a a a verse, verse six. I think is something that we really need as Christians to keep in mind. Because as you mentioned, Skip, we have a tendency to argue amongst ourselves, our own self importance, and our that pride and arrogance kicks in of who's more intellectual, who's more scholarly, scholarly, who went to seminary, who went to ambassador, and all that kind of stuff. One of the things that's important for us to keep in mind because we've all been commissioned. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, to preach the gospel. That is our mandate. It's not a mandate just to the church leadership and the uh, media department at some corporate church. It is a mandate for each and every one of us. And one of the things to keep in mind is we are called to do uh, and preach the gospel to whomever God brings into our sphere, uh, sphere of influence is to remember this word is that no matter what our talents are being used for to preach the gospel, uh, you know, you could plant, you can water, but ultimately God is the one that grows the individual. God's the one that brings the increase, not you, not your talent in speaking, not your talent in preaching, not your talent in, in teaching or speaking in tongues and all of these things. This verse six, but God gives the increase. As long as we're giving uh, that proper thought, then it's harder for the pride to take over and we become self-important in our own mind. That helps us remain humble with this incredible stewardship that has been placed in our laps and we've been mandated to do. Um, it's a fine line we walk. And so keeping verse six in mind is very, very helpful uh, when, you're, when you're doing the work that God has given you to do. Great point, thanks. 
things. Uh, you know, it, it, kind of carrying on with what uh, uh, Michael was saying, you know, their their thoughts seem to be, well, if, if I follow, follow Paul, I'm better than if I followed Apollos. And another, if, if I'm following Apollos, I'm better than if I followed Paul. In both places, God says, whoa, hold on. It's not the men you follow, as Michael just said. It's God and Jesus Christ and their Holy Spirit in you that gives the increase, that causes conversion. You know, I apparently they didn't get it. One person may have been given a certain gift and another given a different gift, but all of the gifts came from the same place. He, he you know, he, he, Paul tells them there are different ways to go about spreading the gospel, but the leadership has to come from God. Now, Expositor's Commentary, which is another excellent co uh, uh, conservative commentary, I think, Paul goes on to declare that many spiritual gifts are given by the same spirit for the total good or profit of his church. Different gifts are given to different people. You know, all of us know people that have talents. And so if you had the ability to hand out gifts that would help people do their job as spreading the gospel, wouldn't you look at these people and go, you know, I tell you, oh, Mike James is pretty good at thus and such. I think I'm going to give him this one. And, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and that's what I think that's what God has done. He uses people's talents. And boy, he knows what those talents are. Um, so, hey, the, yeah. One more thought before you leave verse six. Um, is it okay for me to get myself in trouble once instead of you getting yourself in I trouble? Would, I would love for you to. Thank you, Mike. Okay, I'm going to take some heat. Skip normally says, I'm about to say something that's probably going to get me in a lot of trouble, and he says it anyway. So uh, I'm going to um, uh, re-paraphrase uh, verse six uh, the way uh, it applies to me personally in my life. And then uh, we'll see what kind of a, how big of a smile Skip's got when, when I say this. And again, I'm saying this, me, myself, and I. Skip doesn't even know what I'm going to say, so you can't blame Skip for me saying this. Okay, verse 6. In my life, the Catholic Church planted. The Worldwide Church of God watered, but God's the one that gave the increase. Something else to keep in mind with that verse. Go. Okay, Skip. Yeah. I'm in the doghouse now. You're up. Yeah, glad I didn't say that. <laughs> Skip. Yeah, John. <clears throat> One other comment. Over the years, this verse has meant so much to me um, simply because of the last part of it where it said God gives the increase. And we always wonder, you know, where is the increase? Why have we not grown? Why is there not more growth? Why is God not, God not calling more people? But I look at this very personally as a minister to see how the environment of the congregation and of the body of Christ is being cared for so that God will call people to the proper body where there is a good environment to grow in. And the this the real understanding of that is is the first part of it. Paul said that he planted Apollos watered and God gives the increase. So there is a step-by-step -step procedure that you have to go through and make sure that things are um, where they need to be for God to call people. Because why would he call them to a body that is totally mixed up and has problems and, you know, fighting among themselves? You know, we, we have to look at it from, from that aspect so that we make sure we're doing our part, in other words. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think also um, kind of <clears throat> uh, tack on to what, what John was saying there is is <laughs> you see this is a kind of an injunction to, to really maybe um, how do I put this? Uh, that the ministers are, are to 
they're they're to blame for all the all the things that are going on, right? Everything lays at their feet. And Paul's like, hey, look, there's other there, we are all complicit in this thing. We all have our talents, we all have our gifts. And so really the onus is on each individual. Um, there was this really cool thing that uh, Lenny Cascio brought up, which about the uh, Nehemiah, when he was rebuilding the wall, there was different portions of the wall that each people were accountable for, like different portions of the wall. And he's like, look, just worry about your portion of the wall. Don't be worried about what's going on over there with them. Uh, what, why aren't they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Why don't they, you know, why aren't they, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, the, the, the sermon and the, the songs and everything else, right? They, they just worry about what your little lot is, what your talents are, what you have, um, and, and, and it'll all work out. So um, yeah, I think that we're too, let's say, too concerned with other people. And, and a lot of times uh, the lay members seem to really lay it on thick to the, to the ministers, it seems like. And I'm not saying that because I'm recently ordained. I haven't, I haven't personally had someone do that to me, but I've seen that being done to other people. Yeah, and, and that was good that, that, Lenny, uh, that Lenny posted that. That was interesting. Okay, so after talking about the difference in the differences in the gifts and that they come to you and that it, 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 it takes uh, several people, uh, you know, that God uses people to get you in line, if you will. Um, after speaking of all of that, here we are in verse seven. He says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. The manifestation of the spirit for the common good. The visible works of the Holy Spirit and the invisible works, but the visible ones is who we're talking about, what we're talking about here, are for everyone's benefits. It doesn't matter who gets the credit. You know, everybody would be, would, would be better off if they do have a gift is to use it, help people, and don't let anybody know about it. The Greek word translated manifestation means to make visible or observable. So to each one is giving the observable spirit for the common good, or the, the results are observable. There's a reason that God has given these gifts to the Corinthians, and that's so everyone can profit. More people become interested in this strange faith that has come into the midst of Corinth because of these gifts. Verse eight, well, eight through 11. For to one, is given, and, you know, and, and, and Paul goes through and describes several different gifts. I don't know that there's any reason for me to read all of that. Y'all can read it yourself. Um, and But in, in verse 11, he brings it all together. He says, but all of these works that God's spirit, the one spirit, dividing to each man severally as he will. Again, Paul shows that the gifts given to people may be different, but they all come from the same place. He's basically telling them that they all need them in order to get the job done. They need all of the different pieces, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking in other languages. You know, that's a gift that would come in really handy as you're crossing an area like Asia Minor, where you run into people that speak completely different languages. You know, that, that would really be one that comes in handy or to have the interpretation of tongues, to know what somebody's saying coming back to you in a language that you're not familiar with. So he's, he's basically telling them they need all of these things, all of these gifts in order to get the job done. Now, construction. 
in construction these days, there are specialists. Years ago, two good carpenters could take a house from the ground up to the roof and, and basically only have to hire plumbers, maybe painters and, and roofers. Well, it's not that way anymore. The foundation uh, concrete guys come in and they pour the, pour the concrete and, and smooth out the, the foundation. They dig and pour the foundation. Then the block layers come in. Now, that's up here in northeast Arkansas. Uh, some places they, well, they do here in Jonesboro, but in, in Pocahontas, uh, there weren't a lot of slabs. They were mostly uh, foundation and blocks. But anyway, so then the block layers come in and lay the blocks, and then the framers come in, and the framers take it up to the ceiling joist. And then the truss folks come in. And, and they put the trusses on, which form the ceiling and the roof. Each part of the construction is done by experts. Paul's telling the Corinthians basically the same thing. There are some who've been given wisdom, some knowledge, but both are coming from the same spirit. So what, what good is knowledge without wisdom? Isn't there a scripture about that? You know, uh, you, you need to know how to use the wisdom that God gives you. Second Timothy 3, 7. He's talking about people and even today, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, this has been going on for thousands of years. God foretold this in the book of Daniel. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Can you picture today the, the people running to and fro? Some of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life, and I do not want to get a political conversation started. Some of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life were said by people who are making decisions to run this country. And I'm not talking about this last week. I'm not talking about the last four years. I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about that's the way it's been for a long time. We elect a bunch of idiots. Oh, sorry, I'm getting political. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm off of that. Back to verse eight. Uh, Wait, I, hold on. You, you brought up, you mentioned it, and it does apply to what we're talking about here, Skip, in terms of uh, here we go. politician. <laughs> no, in all, serious, in all seriousness, what's happened to the country politically, we've already experienced as a, as a church spiritually. Because what happens is we absolve ourselves of our responsibility of putting all our faith and trust in other people and their talents and their gifts. And then we're told that it's not up to us you know, to, uh, to to take responsibility that it's only for those that want the, you know, uh, uh, seminary or want the ambassador or, or are, are ordained by the leadership in order to make these decisions because you, quite frankly, as a layman, are, are not uh, capable of making such decisions. And we became, as a church, and not just our church culture, this is, a, this is probably all of them, we left uh, the leadership of everything up to professionals. And it's the professionals that come up with the most idiotic, ridiculous sounding things that, are, you know, where did common sense go? Well, when people are groomed to be quote unquote leaders based on a, you know, for lack of a better word, a, a religious caste system of ministers and or pastors, popes, bishops, whatever. Uh, and then they're the ones that make all the arbitrary decisions about everything. And then they make put themselves in a bubble that's separate from what the lay people have to deal with on a regular basis. And then the people that are in charge start making decisions that poorly affect those that they're supposedly serving. And, uh, you know, we see that happening in our country now politically, but we've all seen what happens in a spiritual basis as far as church leadership goes when the same exact thing happens. So I just think your point, Skip, I think fits into what you're trying to talk about here without saying, I don't want to get political, but it's not a matter of getting political in terms of party. I think the principle of what we're dealing with here on that is important to consider because, you know, as human beings, we make keep making the same stupid mistakes over and over again, not just politically, but 
also when it comes to organizational skills. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Now, all all of these gifts that are listed in verses eight through ten um, should be working together. All the people that have these gifts should be working together, but apparently they aren't. Pride has crept into this congregation. That's Rod's favorite word: is pride. Pride. Uh, he, you know, he's he he talks about it all the time. That it's it's a it's a terrible sin. So the gifts aren't being used as they should be. So in in the next couple of verses, Paul puts it all together. Oops, I put I put all these words in here. Okay, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. This is this is such a Paulism. <laughs> Paul say he's saying. Okay, look, we've got the ecclesia, the called out ones, the the church, and it has many members, but they are still just one body. And they should be working together. We should be working together. You know, and here I go. I don't think we ought to have to, I don't think we ought to fight and fuss and argue and, and tell people from other churches that they're wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. I, I just don't. And my experience is that you don't have to. Okay. Verse 13, for by one spirit, God's spirit, we are all baptized into one body, the body of Christ, the church, the ecclesia, what, whatever term you, you want to use. And it doesn't matter whether we're Jews or Gentiles. It doesn't matter whether we're slaves or free because we've all been made to drink into one spirit. Paul uses an analogy of the body in two different ways here. First, he talks about the body of Christ, of which we are all members. Then he says our nationality is irrelevant, whether we're Jews or Gentiles. Romans 12, 4. For as we have many members in one body, right? Don't we? And all members don't have the same office. Everybody's not going to be doing the same thing. You're never going to get anywhere. If, you know, let's say that there's, uh, oh, I don't want to give any stupid uh, analogy. You, you all understand what this means. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Everybody doesn't do the same things. Ephesians 4.4. 4. There's one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know, Paul's really getting down to the meat and the coconut here. Next, he, he talks about how the different parts of the body should work together. And one part cannot believe that it's more important than another part. For the body is not one member, but many. And this, this is an analogy that Paul gives that, that's really, that's just perfect. If the foot says, well, because I'm not of the hand, I'm not of the body. I'm not important. I'm not a hand. I'm, I'm just a foot. And then he asks the redundant question, is it therefore not of the body? Well, of course it is. And if the ear says, well, because I'm not of the eye, then I must not be part of the body. And again, rhetorically, is it therefore not of the body? Of course it is. If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If the whole body was a, an ear, how would, how would you smell? And, you know, and this is a great analogy that there are different parts of the body and we have different roles. We have different talents. And he's talking to the Corinthians who have been given these great gifts. 
but they're not using them correctly. And pride has crept in. All body parts must work together in order for us to survive, right? What if your liver turns on you? What's going to happen? What if your heart turns on you? You know, I, I have angioedema and my tongue swells up and it literally turns on me. It tries to kill me. Uh, you know, all body parts must work together in order for us to survive. And so it is with spiritual gifts. The eye is better at seeing than the ear. Duh. And the ear's better at hearing than the eye. Had the Corinthians worked together with all the spiritual gifts God gave them, the gospel would have gone out from there all over the world in power. But obviously they didn't. I mean, Corinth could have been a headquarters for spreading the gospel. It was a wealthy place. It was easy to get to. It was safe. It was tucked up in a cove where the ships could come in and, and, and be safe. And over time, with these spiritual gifts, the Corinthians could have changed the whole philosophy of that pagan city. Verse 18. But now, okay, now God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. He created us. And, and you know, the, the, the old saying, I'm, I'm sure y'all have heard this before and probably think of me a lot when you, when, when you think of this, but God gave us two ears and one mouth. And, you know, my wife has, has reminded me of, of that. Many times, Diane, Diane's uh, got some pretty good insight. God has given gifts based on his plan, not any human's plan. He continues to hammer home the point that all these parts must work together. Apparently, Paul, who rather rarely says anything subtly, I mean, I mean, Paul's in your face. He is... He can't spell the word subtle. Uh, he's using subtlety to teach the Corinthians that they all need to work together. Verse 19. And, 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 and if they were all one member, where was the body? But now there are many members, but there's still one body. And the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. No, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. You know, uh, the, the ring finger on your right hand. What in the world good is that other than holding your hand together, holding an apple? The members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, fourth finger, right hand, not the ring finger. We need the ring finger, don't we? Upon these, we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely, and this it comely talks about your appearance, the, the way you look. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. And he's talking about spiritual gifts, and he's talking about the gifts that people don't think are as important, but they are. It takes all of them to work together. Verse 25, they all need to work together that there should be no schism in the body, that there shouldn't be a split. Wow, we've seen a few of those, haven't we? But that the members should have the same care one for another. And guess what? They didn't. And 
I hate to say this, but some of us don't either. There must have been problems with the Corinthian church about which gift was more important. Paul has spent a lot of time talking about that. He's been hammering the point home that no gift or member is more important than another. It might be more comely. It might seem to be more important, but it's not. Verse 26, and whether one member suffers, and, and you know, he's analogizing different parts of our body. Uh, and whether one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And then in verse 27, he starts bringing this thing to the end. He says, now, you're the body of Christ, but you're different members, you're different parts, you have different talents, you have different jobs. And but 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 he says God has set some in the church, some are apostles, some are prophets, some are teachers, some work miracles. He's talking about Corinth. Some have the gift of healing, helps, governments, you know, uh, uh, putting things together, organizing, and so on, and and different languages. I suppose some will think that Paul is listing those things in order of importance. We can't help it either, can we? But in order to do that, a person would have to be to have to totally ignore the context of this whole chapter. Paul's entire point is that no gift or position is more important than another. All he is doing here is to tell them and us that there are different jobs that must be done in order for the body of Christ, the church, to function properly, for the gospel to be promoted as efficiently as possible. He again simply makes the point that there are several different gifts that God has given to people to further his gospel to the world. And he gave those gifts to the people of the church, the called out ones in Corinth. But it seems to me that they wasted them. I don't, I don't see any historical evidence that this church did what it was supposed to do. And, and then in, in verse 29, he kind of goes back to, to the, the same thing. He said, is everybody an apostle? Is everybody a prophet? Is everybody a teacher? Can everybody work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with different languages? Do all interpret? And he says, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. Coveting the best gifts is not the best way. It's not a more excellent way. What, that's the last verse. I've got one more. That's the last verse in chapter 12. What is the more excellent way? That's going to have to wait till next time, but I'm going to give you a hint. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, messengers, but do not have love, I'm worthless. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. All right, that's our buddy Paul talking to our friends, the Corinthians, who had lots of gifts, but apparently didn't use them right. Thoughts, comments, corrections? Uh, just the uh, thoughts that you talk about the body, it always brings up to mind, you know, human nature automatically wants to create a caste system of importance of which gift or which talent or which ability is, is, is in the hierarchy, the ranking system. 
And, uh, and I think the point here, and this fits perfectly with what Jesus was telling the disciples himself, you know, and Paul's using the analogy of body parts, you know, how we all fit jointly together and some parts are designed to do certain things and other parts are designed to do something else, but everybody wants to be the head or the eyes or the ears because they're, you know, more noticeable and they're, they're the ones that make all the decisions and yet Anybody that survived a bowel obstruction will know that even though the bowels are the least regarded part of the body, once that gets stopped up, uh, it affects everything. And if it's not taken care of in the proper way, it could kill everything and you could die from it. And so I think that's a good analogy. And it just fits with what Jesus himself was saying in terms of being a servant. You know, he among you would be great, uh, you know, in the kingdom of God than be a servant. You know, I mean, there's you, using that bodily anal you know, analogy, there's nothing more lowly than, you know, your, your, your bowels. But, you know, if they're not working properly, if they're not regarded and taken care of, then the whole body could suffer to the point of death if it's not taken care of properly. And I think that is a good analogy that Paul uses, which fits with what Jesus said in terms of being a servant, not esteeming other, uh, you know, yourself better than other people. Yeah, that's so a good Another good analogy. Yeah, it also could be a really useful scripture to go to in reference to how women can serve. Um, look, you know, none of us are any better than one another, and every role um, is important. So I'm getting some feedback here. Um, but I think that would be a really helpful bit of scripture to, to point out to maybe some women uh who are let's say maybe a little frustrated with maybe only being able to do what they have been doing and, and letting them know that this is <laughs> that they look uh this is you know we can't do what we do or you know um i always tell my wife you know she, if she wasn't there taking care of jeremiah i couldn't do what i'm doing here uh and it's you know we're a team effort you know and um and i, I take care of a lot of the finances and so it's a it's a yeah it's a it's a well old machine right and so the same thing with with uh, with the church as well, so yeah, and, a, and a great study, Skip. Um, good job. Thanks. And also, you know, what's going on in the political arena does seem to be a little bit like a form of religion to me. Um, so that was not uh, an un untort an untort uh, comparison, Michael. Earlier, uh, <laughs> uh, goes both ways, right? Yeah, I was just, you know, jumping on what Skip said because he didn't said he didn't want to get political. And I just automatically saw the uh, congregational application because we've already been through it. And it was political, but in a church congregation setting as opposed to a national politic or a secular political. But it, it's the same thing. I mean, human nature is what it is. Yeah, Mike James, you're up. Yeah, uh, verses 12 through the end where it's uh describing the different body parts skip i was getting the impression that you were suggesting that the different body parts were more like uh the different gifts i i don't disagree with that but don't wouldn't you agree that um the different body parts being described there are not just about the gifts but also about individuals within the church like blake was just saying uh women is one example uh, i would suggest also when it's talking about the weaker vessels in verses uh 22 and 23 or the less honorable um we we had a really good um a really good uh, learning experience by dealing with a uh, paranoid schizophrenic individual in my local church a number of years ago. Uh, we dealt with him for a number of years and, uh, you know, definitely some people looked down on him or uh, afraid of him, but through our experience with him, I believe everyone in the church uh, grew tremendously. So, uh, just your thoughts on on that section of scripture and you seem to be emphasizing the gifts uh but i think you did you did mention that this could be uh, addressing individual people also any thoughts skip yeah i agree with you 100 percent. i think what paul was dealing with was a group of people in corinth but the message i think that we're to take from this is that god 
he, he is talking about different uh, people. And I mean, I, you've probably heard me say this, Michael. I believe that uh, there are different parts of the body of Christ that aren't all, uh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Michael, <laughs> you know, that aren't all Sabbath keepers, that aren't all, uh, you know, in in our little, little church group. I think God works sort of like he told uh, uh, Elijah. You know, there's 7,000 out there, Elijah, you don't even know about. And so I agree with you 100% that uh, he's talking about the body of Christ, which is different people with different talents, different thoughts, different approaches, different doctrines. I don't know if that's the direction you wanted to, or if that was a question you were asking me, but uh, I, 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 that's the way I look at it. Well, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm concerned by your use of different doctrines. Uh, I I get where you're going for the most part. I just feel that um, there is one truth. Uh, God can use whoever He wants. He knows the heart, and I leave that up to Him. But I do believe there is a truth that we need to be seeking. Uh, and there are some doctrines that are not the truth. So uh, I, I hear you skip to it to a to a degree, uh, but uh, I also feel that there is a truth, and uh, we need to be seeking that. Uh, we don't all have it, of course, but uh, we definitely need to be seeking the truth of God. Yeah, and, and I understand. I agree. Um, I think that uh, I think we have as much or more truth than any other church group, but I don't think we have all truth. And I'll be glad when we do. When Jesus Christ comes back, we will. Uh, but what where I'm coming from, Mike, is that we eliminate so many people from uh, our consideration of being Christians. And as you said, that ain't our job. I can definitely agree with that statement, uh, Skip. No doubt about it. I'm 100% I'm with you on that. Skip, I wonder, if, I wonder if maybe we are seeing God working in that direction in the proliferation of non-denominational churches where they're not trying to be a Baptist or a Methodist or a, a Catholic, but actually, you know, in many cases, trying to figure out what the Bible means and, and going through the whole, you know, I, I know of one local church where, uh, it's almost like, well, like our Bible studies that uh, the preacher in it seems to go through, uh, you know, an entire book over the course of, you know, several months and trying to figure out what it all means and put it all together. And I, I I mean, these people seem to be more focused on what the Bible says than on preaching what their denomination says. And I wonder if that's, if that's the beginning of, you know, I, I, you know, another way in which God is working to, to bring more people to a more, a better understanding of the truth. Um, that's a good. I, I said uh, that well, or not? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I got what you're saying, James. I think it fits. Uh, uh, but when I was a kid, there weren't any de non-denominational churches that I was aware of. Well, like I'm I sure said, that, that depends on where you lived, I think, because when I grew up, there were Bible, you know, non-denominational Bible churches all over the place in the, the suburbs of Chicago. So it's it's nothing new, at least for where I was from. Um, and I don't know if that was because people wanted to escape, you know, hierarchy or, you know, church politics or whatever. Who knows? I'm not sure. Every church has gone through similar things we've all gone through. 
I think where we run into trouble as human beings is, and I think that's what Paul's point in the study that Skip brought out, is we get into trouble when we start arbitrarily making the decision of uh, which one is to be esteemed more godly or more important or more righteous or more with it than, than, than any other group or, or any other body part or any other, you know, function. Um, you know, that, that's something that, that we, you know, we have a tendency to do. That's why I said earlier, I says, you know, using the verse six, where I said that, you know, the, the Catholic church planted in my life and the worldwide church of God watered, because that's exactly how I got called into the truth. But according to worldwide church doctrine, I was to look at the Catholic church as Satan's church, that they were not of God and were never of God. And I, they, I was never to, uh, to regard them as such. You know, our brethren in India, we talked about them a bit earlier. Um, you know, it was a Pentecostal minister that was uh, uh, doing an evangelistic campaign back in uh, 1959 that converted uh, Prasad's grandfather, uh, Ch Chitty's dad, to Christianity. He converted him into uh, um, a, a Pente Pentecostal Christian belief system from Hinduism. W would we, in our former cultural understanding, say, well, that was not of God? Because that, that church is not of God, it's Satan's church, and therefore God had nothing to do with it and no part with it. Because God has no part of, uh, with darkness. And that was our official church position. But when you look at the fruits of what was done there in India, a Pentecostal uh, a minister was used by God to plant the seed of truth in Hindus that converted to Christianity. And through the course of time, through the power of the Holy Spirit, they stumbled on the biblical truths that we do in terms of the Sabbath. And then later the holy days and they started wondering how do we keep these what do we do is there any other churches out there that that keep these things and god brought them into fellowship with us even though god established you know their understanding long before he brought us into fellowship with them but if we had the mindset that well god's never going to work with a hindu church that was called by uh, a, a pentecostal uh you know evangelist because that's not you know of god that's of the devil and that's where we get into major trouble. And I think that's what, at least that's what I get out of this lesson, what Paul's talking about that Skip gave us, in terms of it's not up to us to place uh, hierarchies and, and what's more important in terms of the body of which one's to be esteemed of God and which one is not, which gift is more important than another. And that's that's a human nature trait, and that's how Satan divides us. And I think that's what I got out of a lot of the study tonight. So thanks. Yeah. For love of the truth, I think, you know, really trues a lot of this up. Um, and that's how Prasad came, because he loved, he wanted to know what was true. Um, and <laughs> Wait, let me correct. He, Prasad was raised in the church. It was Prasad's, uh, okay. yeah, it was Prasad's grandfather in 1959 that was called out of Hinduism into Christianity. And it was uh, uh, Prasad's father, John, who converted as a young boy to Christianity because of his father. So Prasad was raised within the faith, it, you okay. know, so just so you're, so you understand. Well, yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, Prasad's father for the love of that, that, you know, the truth again, right? And and I think, you know, if, if we don't, if we, <laughs> the, the problem with that is when, once you have the truth, you have, you start to play this little game called, I know something you don't know. You might've heard of this game. Uh, you might've played it a couple of times too. And it, it divides. And it gets it's hubris and it, and it gets puffed up and paul talks about that too and, and, and there's really a um a delicate balance between having what i consider to be and i agree with mike that there is there is a correct way um to say that the always are and i don't think skip was saying that the always are are, are valid um i think he was saying that there's just again they have different aspects of the same uh the same uh religion and 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 I think that we have some things that they don't, and they might they might have some things that we don't. We don't know. Um, and, and there that that's where that kind of and but the 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 kind of mentality Skip has as far as being uh, gentle and meek uh, and presenting the way that you think about something, the way you feel about something, is the key. Uh, you know, humbly bringing to these uh, folks what you consider to be the the truth, um, and 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 humbly again because you know Paul says uh, uh, we we look through the glass darkly. Uh, we do, we have been given, I think, some some incredible distinctions uh, through the Holy Spirit about um, these Old Testament. You know, a lot of the one of what we, we call our doctrinal distinctives, 
um, but at the same time, you know, present them meekly. Um, so anyways, yeah, great study. And, and yeah, hierarchy is, is woven into us. And, and part of me thinks that hierarchy, dominance hierarchy is a, um, I don't know if it's, if it's, I think it's from Satan, but I, but it, but it is such a, um, it teaches, it teaches you so much. Um, you know, anyone who has gotten a little too big for their own britches and then taken down a peg or two, uh, like I have uh, several times, um, you, I've learned so much in those, in those moments um, where I was brought, um, you know, kicking and screaming to, uh, you know, um, how, how I wasn't all that in a bag of chips. And, um, and, and those are good moments. So I, I have a hard time wondering if, if it's from <laughs> dominance hierarchy is from, from the, the enemy uh, or if it's, uh, you know, the God given thing. Uh, that's just we're kind of born with and we're, we're we need to overcome that thing. But anyways, I'll stop rambling. Yeah. I, um, what's the old saying? If if you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. So uh, <laughs> I'm going <quit, laughs> to I'm going to quit digging. But, I, you know, the way I look at all of this is that that a, a lot of people that I know that don't. Uh, uh, have the same doctrines that I have, if you will, um, still profess a very sincere faith in Jesus Christ and a love for God and the acceptance of his sacrifice and so on. So when I'm talking about doctrines, I'm talking about I don't care if someone believes that um, there's going to be a rapture. I don't care. I don't see it. I don't think there's going to be one. I don't see it in the scriptures. Uh, but if God wants to have a rapture, I hope I'm there. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's there. And that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about that that I don't think really matters. What matters is our faith in Jesus Christ and trying our best to obey Him. And uh, you know, I one way that I look at it is that we're all on the same, not everybody, but those of us who, who truly believe in Jesus Christ and who have the Holy Spirit. I'll just leave that open there. I think we're all on the same road. We're just at different mile markers. And it's not my job to decide who has the most truth, you know, us or them or whatever. Mike, I don't know, Michael, I, I don't, I mean, Mike, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but, you know, I believe what we do is what we should do. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Skip. I, I just feel that, you know, sometimes uh, when we're talking, we, we don't know each other well enough or the details of our lives or the various experiences uh so when we make statements we're all hearing it from uh our filters and um you know sometimes if people don't know you as well as i do uh you know they're going to hear certain things in what you say and they're going to hear certain things in what i say and the best thing is is for us to just try to explain ourselves as much as we can and i, I know where you're at skip uh I, i'm just you know i was brought up greek orthodox uh I never thought that uh, the people there were Satanists or anything. Uh, when I left, I was never in Worldwide also. Uh, so I've never had the feeling that, um, you know, other Christians are of the devil or something like that. But, uh, you know, uh, doctrines like uh, the immortality of the soul and, um, you know, what, what happens uh, after we die. Uh, I believe there, that Satan is using those as deceptions to lead people away from God. Yeah, I, I get the rapture. That's not a big one for me. Uh, I don't agree with it. But uh, I think some of them, some of these doctrines are bigger than others uh, as far as uh, what Satan's trying to do with those deceptions and uh, how he can lead people uh, away from God, um, you know, God can always bring him back and, and do whatever he wants with them. I leave that up to him. 
but I'm going to try to seek out his truth and his word uh, to the best of my ability. And I'm just concerned with getting myself there, man. Uh, I'm going to try to help others, but uh, that's between them and God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you bring up a really good point, Mike, and <clears throat> something to consider when you, you know, in terms of it, it, how do I phrase this? I think where we get into trouble is when we start looking at other church uh, doctrines and denominations that have different doctrinal understandings, which are not biblical or extra biblical, like the immortality of the soul and the doctrine of hell and all of that. Um, yeah, we don't believe in that. We understand something different because God opened our minds to understand differently. One of the blessings that we have at our disposal in terms of uh, well, preaching the gospel, but in essence, showing other Christians the way of the Lord more perfectly. Because in an age of evil that we're entering into, and I've seen this with the brethren in India, um, you know, if we're helping other Christians see, you know, give them an anchor to their faith. Because what happens when in, in an age of persecution that we're entering, when the traditions of men that have been grafted into the church are shown to be uh, not of biblical you know, soundness, uh, they're just traditions and they, they, they blow away in the wind, where is their strength going to be in terms of standing up for Jesus Christ? It, because if they've been led to believe in a false doctrine and Satan can use that, to say, well, that, you believed in a lie that wasn't true. What else is untrue? Uh, we have a blessing with what we understand and the doctrinal understandings God has given us in in the Sabbaths and the holy days, in the uh, you know, in our understanding of what happens when we die, and that God loves us enough that we're not going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever. That there's there's an eternal death, but not an eternal torment and, and burning ever hellfire. We can use what we understand to help. Uh, provide a better anchor of, fa uh, of faith to those that already believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and just don't understand what we do so that when this persecution that's starting to, you know, pick up here uh, is laid and people are starting to fold like, like, you know, cheap suits because, well, if this was doctrine was bogus, then what else is bogus? Uh, by giving other Christians an anchor of their, their faith, they can stand for the truth without wavering a little bit stronger than they otherwise would have. And that may be a mandate that God will will have some of us perform in this country in terms of helping other Christians that are not within our church culture to stand for truth. Because if you look around, folks, that's what we're losing in this country. Everything now is we're supposed to believe in lies and fairy tales, and we're supposed to agree with lies and fairy tales. Or we could go to prison, go to jail, uh, be arrested for, uh, I guess the thing now is uh, 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 spreading misinformation. Uh, or wrong, uh, misguided narratives. And that can be transferred from a government political issue down to a church spiritual issue. And uh, we're entering some very dangerous times and we have to continue to point people towards the truth. And it doesn't have to necessarily be doctrine specific, but if you run into those moments, helping give another Christian an anchor to what they understand so they can with, you know, stand in the, in the day of the windstorm that's coming uh, they may, you know, God may say, well done, you know, good and faithful servant for helping give an anchor to their faith at a time of tribulation that's, that's soon to be upon us. So, yeah, Mike, I, I agree with what you said. Uh, you know, I'm dealing with people overseas in, in Asia and Africa, and uh, a lot of them, you know, come to us and uh, they, they have Pentecostal backgrounds and things of that nature. And I'm not making a big, big stink about, uh, all the doctrines initially, um, you know, they're welcome to, to start talking to us and learning from us. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the most important thing, of course, uh, and we can build from that if they've got that already established. Uh, let's just go from there. And, you know, there's no judgment uh, in the people I'm training uh, when they're dealing with these other people. Uh, you know, just, you know, bring them along see what they think about it, uh, tell them where we're at. And, you know, if they don't go for it, you know, that's fine. There's, there's lots of other Christian groups out there they can, they can work with and speak with. Yeah, I, I get you, man. Cool. See what you started, Skip? Yes, I know. I'm good Great. at starting. I'm good at starting that stuff. And you know, another thing, Skip, you, um, well, you were, you were ring, ring feet finger shaming that's not acceptable sir 
Green finger shaming is um is is not uh not copacetic. Yeah. All right. I don't know. I don't know. I it, identify it, as a ring finger. Cancel, Skip was just practicing the cancel culture <laughs> with uh with, with digits on the hand. That's all. It's the end thing right now. That is right. That is right. Well, all right. Anybody else? Um, I've enjoyed this last uh, 30 minutes. This has been good. It's not that I didn't enjoy the first hour, but <laughs> it was kind of all me. But, uh, uh, and I, I, you know, I don't know if I've told you all this or not, but I, I really am uh, slightly intimidated when I do Bible studies to people who know more about the Bible than I know. And it, it, I, I can tell you, it is intimidating. Uh, that does not include you, Blake. It's other people that actually do. <laughs> Dang, for a second there, I was like, all right. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally get where you're coming from. I, I, I stand up there and I'm like, okay, so they're going to call me out on this. After every, after every sermon, I, or before every sermon, I say, hey, look, um, who am I to talk to y'all? <laughs> so, uh, if you hear something that you disagree with, um, I openly welcome criticism. There's one guy in our church, God love him, and I really like him. Um, but he'll come up to me afterwards and he'll kind of pull. And, and to his credit, he pulls me aside. He says, you know, hey, there's a couple of these things. Do you really need? He'll have him. He'll have a little note. He always has a little note. I know that's that's my reproof. Uh, you know, my my, my rebukes rather. So. Uh, <laughs> well, we we have a, a rule as those of you who've been on our Sabbath morning. Uh, anyway, thank you, Mike. I saw your note. Um, th that uh, they can say whatever they want, whenever they want. They're not going to hurt my feelings or anything. And I've I've heard uh, several times. Skip, I don't know where in the world you got that, Skip. I, I've never heard anybody say that. <laughs> yeah, well, if, yeah. If you really want to have some bake your noodles, just imagine that when you do these studies, you know, you Blake and you Skip, just just you know, for fun, just pretend that you're you're giving this study and uh, Ron Dart's sitting there and uh, he's got his legs crossed as he he used to, and he's just oh, man. Uh, you get it. Watch Skip break out into a cold sweat. Yeah, boy, well, that's now, that I good money to see. That's the truth, and, and and it's Ron's fault that I'm doing this to begin with. He hounded me and hounded me and hounded me until I started a little Bible study at home, and so here here we are. Here we are. I'm happy he did. Yeah, but he he wasn't sitting in any of those, was he? No, no, no. Yeah, I, I would never have given one with I mean, your your analogy is perfect. Well, I was about to say, have you ever given any kind of a talk with him? I know you gave sermons once when he was in the audience, right? Yeah, I've spoken in, yeah, and, and it's, it, it was, it, it was, it was pretty bad. It was, it was pretty yeah, bad. I had, I was giving a seminar at one of the CEM feed, might have been one of the, the second one I went to, and I didn't notice he was there. And I was going into it, and when I glanced over and saw him, he was in the back <laughs> row sitting there. And I just and I made eye quick eye contact with him. You were talking about breaking out of <laughs> wet. That was it. <laughs> that was the moment where like oh, you got it. Oh no, <laughs> you lose all your confidence in a moment. Yeah, well, I've I've made the mistake of getting to know uh, several of, of these guys. Charles Gross uh, uh, always gives me a hard time about. Uh, anything I say, if he's sitting out in the audience, but we're, uh, we do it in, in fun and in jest. Well, listen, I've got to run. Is, is anybody got anything else they want to say? All right. I'm going to cut the recording. Well, what? Just